Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us in this uh, second part series of uh, our lockdown learnings. Today's topic is introduction to industrial ethernet. Uh, we're very excited to present this today. I hope that you get a lot of value from it. Last week, Thursday, we presented introduction to Profibus. Uh, it was quite well attended uh, and the feedback from the attendees is that uh, they they did enjoy the content topic. If you uh, missed that topic, we have uh, uploaded it onto our uh, YouTube page. So if you go to YouTube, type in Industrial Data Exchange, you'll find the full recording of the live webinar. All the series that we are doing during this lockdown learnings uh, will be recorded uh, after the event. So if you do have to go somewhere uh, halfway through the webinar, make sure to, to check out the video afterwards and see if there's anything that you had missed. Um, I'm joined today by one of my co-presenters, Bruce, uh, who also works with me in the Academy. Um, and so any questions in the Q&A that you have during the series, Bruce will be monitoring the Q&A section so he could probably respond to those in uh, text. Uh, but at the end of the lecture today, I suppose it'll probably take about an hour or so, um, I will have a live Q&A session where I will publish uh, a few questions, uh, which some of you may have. And then I'll speak about it in a bit more uh, detail. And I think we got a lot of engagement uh, last week on the profit bus in the Q and A session. Uh, so I think that was was pretty pretty valuable. Uh, but yeah, so today introduction to industrial Ethernet. Uh, on Thursday this week we have introduction to Modbus. It's also going to be about a, about another hour and a half to two hour session. Um, we will talk about Modbus RTU ASCII TCP. Um, so if you have an RSVP for that or received a join link for that, uh, please do drop a a mail to the Academy mailbox and uh, we'll send you a join link. Um, and then the following week on Monday and Tuesday, uh, I do know Monday is a public holiday. Uh, if you cannot attend that series, it will also again be recorded. And I'm sure we'll be running a similar series. But on Monday we have uh, Profi Trace training. There was a lot of interest in the uh, introduction to Profibus uh, session that we did last week for people to get some more uh, training or hands-on training on how to use ProfitTrace, what is ProfitTrace, what can we use the different sub-modules in ProfitTrace to identify certain issues. Uh, so we'll be running that. And then on the Tuesday, next week Tuesday, we have uh, functional bonding and shielding for industrial communication systems or digital systems. And that's a, a very hot topic, very important uh, for all um, plant personnel, engineers, um, and maintenance technicians to, to understand uh, the basics of functional bonding and shielding, uh, which helps to, uh, it actually adds on top of all these different topics which we're covering from Profibus to industrial ethernet, it's all types of field bus. Uh, how do I need to properly ground these systems um, and what is required uh, from a grounding and functional bonding perspective uh, to ensure that I, I have a, um, I mitigate any risk uh, from EMI or noise and interference in the plant environment. Uh, but yep, yeah, my name is uh, Carl Ruiz. I'm one of the uh, training engineers at uh, IDX, or Industrial Data Exchange. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis at work, I offer uh, internationally certified courses from Profibus to Profinet, um, also some other courses on industrial Ethernet in general, uh, Modbus, um, and quite a few other protocols. Um, but yeah. If you do have any questions at the end of this, drop it in the Q&A. Uh, if you manage to miss the Q&A, drop an email to Academy and one of us will assist you on it. Cool, enjoy. Okay, so introduction to industrial Ethernet. I always like to start these uh, sessions with my um, data communication triangle, which basically covers all the data communication uh, systems that can be identified on a uh, site, uh, any traditional industrial um, site, sites itself. Uh, today we're talking about industrial Ethernet. Uh, industrial Ethernet is used in multiple different platforms across the site. Um, and you use Ethernet even in your enterprise um, environment. So Ethernet would traditionally be used integrating uh, cloud to ERP systems, to your management systems, to your supervisory systems. But typically we find that this would be standard, um, standard office type Ethernet um, infrastructure. Uh, today we're going to be talking about this lower part, uh, the industrial Ethernet side of it, where things need to be handled a little bit 
differently. So I'm going to sort of emphasize what are the, the main points where you need to focus um, with regards to industrial ethanol and how that differs from standard um, office ethanol. Although it's the same medium, same transport protocols as such, uh, we, need, we need to uh, take into a few other considerations because uh, of the environment with which industrial ethernet is installed. So today's discussion is going to run through uh, the following topics. Intro to digital systems, where I'll take you through a high level look at um, what mitigating factors are included in industrial ethernet um, and standard industrial communication technologies to protect it from industrial environments. Ethernet basics, um, take you through quite a few topics just for a little bit of understanding what is an IP address, what are VLANs, uh, installation considerations for industrial Ethernet, uh, security considerations, some of the cybersecurity risks that you need to be made aware of and how we can mitigate these risks. And then we'll finish off the session today talking about common industrial Ethernet uh, faults, uh, diagnostics and troubleshooting. There's a bit of an experiential learning um, uh, that I've developed in this field. Uh, so I can share some of my personal site um, experiences um, and how, how we can prevent that. Uh, at the bottom here, you will notice that I have uh, included uh, three logos. You might recognize these, you might not. These are actually three different technologies which are used uh, in the industrial Ethernet space. So they use industrial uh, Ethernet technologies to transfer them. These are what we call protocols. Uh, they're basically languages which are transferred um, in industrial communication systems. So Ethernet RP, Modbus, TCP, and uh, Profinet are two of the most uh, common protocols which we find in this space. This is a very interesting uh, graph for me. Um, uh, it's actually developed by a company called uh, HMS Communication <coughs> Networks. And it basically, each year they do a study, I think they get some data from their own um, manufacturing systems, but also from a lot of the other larger vendors uh, to sort of apply a generalized market share um, in each of the uh, technology spaces. Uh, and what they include over here is on the field bus space and the industrial ethernet space. Uh, this was from 2019. Uh, it's accuracy, I, I can't speak for, but I find it a very uh, interesting graph. Uh, the main thing which I would like to highlight here is the market space in industrial communication networks, which is held by industrial ethernet. It's 59%, which means that it surpassed standard field bus, um, which has been the medium of choice uh, for, for many years. Um, what should be noted though, uh, I think most of the viewers of this webinar are um, in sub-Saharan Africa. I know we do have a couple from the European environment. Uh, this graph is taking a perspective globally. Um, so if you look at the total global numbers, that's not exactly accurate to what we see in South Africa. And if I have to speak from my own personal experience, Profibus is substantially higher in the market share perspective for uh, the South African environment, um, where we have uh, quite, a, quite a bit more Profibus uh, in, in installed, uh, but we are starting to adopt uh, new Ethernet-based technologies such as Ethernet IP um, and um, Profinet. So maybe we're a little bit slower, slower to adopt, maybe two to three years behind uh, the European and American markets. Um, I suppose we want them to make all the mistakes and then we can do it properly outside. <laughs> uh, this is another interesting graph. I actually got this from the uh, profibus.com uh, website. It was developed by IHS Market Technology. Um, this was based in 2018 and it kind of gave an overview of the technology space. Now this is just purely industrial ethernet. So these are all the industrial, the main industrial ethernet uh, protocols, which you'll see ethernet, um, ethernet IP, Profinet, uh, you have Ethercat, and then uh, this splits us up between Modbus, TCP, Powerlink, and a few of the others. Um, one confusion that is very commonly made, um, and where it comes from, is uh, my, my company also sells gateways. So a lot of the times we have to uh, spec uh, gateways for companies who want to convert from one protocol to another. And the confusion comes in is between Ethernet IP and Ethernet TCP IP based protocols. So a lot of times I request, oh, I want to convert uh, Profibus to Ethernet. It's like, well, there's there's a lot of Ethernet protocols. I mean, Profinet's an Ethernet protocol, Ethernet RP is an Ethernet protocol. Um, so so it's important to have that definition that, yes, it's Ethernet, but what, what is the actual language on the Ethernet side itself? So this is, a, this is an interesting graph, but there are two of the definite main players in here are Ethernet RP and Profinet. 
two rules that are very different to each other, but both run off industrial Ethernet infrastructure. So let's jump into intro to digital systems. Um, so when we start off there, there's a couple of uh, external factors that can affect your industrial effect, um, your industrial communication systems. Uh, this affects all field buses, um, all Ethernet infrastructure, analog signals as well. And that's uh, both electrostatic and electromagnetic interference. Um, the first interference I want to talk about electrostatic interference. This is caused by high voltage cabling running close to your industrial Ethernet infrastructure. Um, and what happens is uh, this actually causes interference uh, when it's run in close proximity uh, to industrial Ethernet cable. The easiest way to protect uh, from electrostatic interference is purely just to provide a separation distance between your high voltage cabling and your uh, industrial communication infrastructure. When I talk about high voltage cabling, um, uh, I do love it when uh, the high current or uh, high voltage electrical guys jump on my courses because they often argue with me about what high voltage is. Um, I think in their context, high voltage is anything above 1.5 kV. In my context for industrial communication systems, high voltage is pretty much anything above 60 volts AC and DC. Uh, so anything above the voltage you want to provide a separation from your uh, industrial Ethernet cables. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about what that separation requirement actually is. The second main form of interference is called electromagnetic interference. Uh, this is caused by devices that create electromagnetic fields um, and they can actually, what happens when you have a magnetic field being generated, it causes a charge to flow um, in nearby conductive objects, which is ultimately causing a charge to flow in the copper um, uh, conductive cores of your Ethernet cable, and this can be very bad news for industrial communication systems. Things that create uh, electromagnetic fields would be things most commonly would be BSDs, uh, very noisy devices. Again, easiest way to protect against electromagnetic interference is move yourself away from that source of electromagnetic interference. Uh, but Ethernet uh, does have a way, or industrial Ethernet cables do have a way to protect themselves. Uh, you'll notice that if you had to strip the shielding away from an industrial Ethernet cable, the each you'll find that each of the pairs are twisted. So you'll have a couple of twisted pairs, anything from uh, four to eight um, cores, which uh, have twisted pairs inside them. Um, and what this twisting does is it helps to where a charge is caused to flow um, in that conductive object on adjacent loops, the charge cancels it or the current cancels itself out. Uh, so it's important to use uh, correctly specced Ethernet or industrial Ethernet type cable, uh, depending on your application. One way which can protect from a both electrostatic and magnetic interference would be running your uh, communication networks or your industrial Ethernet cable inside um, uh, steel or aluminium uh, chunking or conduit, but it's uh, very important that that conduit is grounded at multiple different points, but it will also serve no form of protection whatsoever. Um, and if you're using multi uh, cable trays, uh, make sure that there is bonding on each of the um, walls separating your different cable categories. And there's a bonded lid at the top as well. And very good practice is to not only, um, well, you obviously in industrial Ethernet have to use shielded Ethernet cable. Uh, this shielded Ethernet cable needs to be grounded at multiple points, um, mainly at two points, which would be at the device itself. Uh, where you're using an industrial Ethernet connector that has a metal housing. He'll drain any noise picked up in the field from the shield to the DIN rail through the device or through a separate functional bonding connection. Sometimes that's not good enough. It's often even better practice. Strip away some of the outer covering of the cable as well as it enters and exits panels um, and actually ground the shielding so that any noise, EMI, electrostatic or magnetic interference picked up in the field drains to this point before it actually gets to the device. We spoke about separating your um, separating your industrial Ethernet cable from electrostatic and magnetic sources of interference, such as high voltage cables, uh, BSDs and other noisy devices. Uh, this is a very good table to, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, cable categories, well, we, here we separate the cables into different categories based on their voltage and function. Uh, in your cable category one, this is, would be your uh, standard 24 volt DC power supplies. 
This would also be your industrial Ethernet cables. It would be your Profibus cables. Um, pretty much anything that's below 60 volts um, DC current and 25 volts AC current falls into cable category one. Any of these category cables can sit right next to each other. There's no need to separate them um, at all. Uh, Cable category two is anything above that 60 volts DC, 25 volts AC, up to 400 volts AC and DC. This needs to be separated by at least 10 centimeters from cable category one. So if you have a 220 20 volt supply to one of your power supplies in a cabinet, this needs to be at least 10 centimeters away from your industrial Ethernet cable at all times. Cable category three, anything above 400 volts AC or DC falls into cable category three. This should be at least 20 centimeters away from your industrial ethernet cable. And category four is anything that has a risk of a lightning strike. Uh, things that could have a risk of a lightning strike might be a power cable going up to a lighting post in the field. It could be a cable running between buildings. Um, this should be at least 50 centimeters separated from all of your cable categories. Let's jump into ethernet basics. So probably one of the best features of uh, Ethernet is its possibility to interconnect um, and easily extend networks without a lot of effort. Uh, last week we spoke about Profibus and Profibus pretty much a network can only be one network. You can't connect multiple networks into the same infrastructure and the main reason is because there's no concept of routing. With Ethernet that's completely different. We can run hundreds and hundreds of protocols all using the same infrastructure sharing the same medium um, and that's where the, the biggest advantage comes in it. A simple example of how we can interconnect all these different systems um, would be connecting internet to your corporate network, to your storage or database type systems, to your actual industrial uh, communication networks. Even integrating third party services such as standard IoT devices, um, which for example could fetch some data directly from your controllers, put an app on your device, and this is another security thing we'll uh, chat about a little bit uh, a little bit later. Um, and we're also going to yeah, speak about Steve at the top of here. Uh, Steve is somebody who has malicious intention. And uh, when you're connecting your um, industrial communication systems to an internet network, it's important to note that there is Steve out there. So we need to take into account that we need to implement the correct components, the correct procedures. Um, and they correct uh, industry standards to make sure that Steve cannot uh, access your industrial uh, communication networks and plant environments. Um, for those of you not familiar, uh, this table in front of you is uh, called an OSR model. An OSR model is used to describe a communication system. Uh, it can be used to describe any communication system. Uh, for example, Profibus. Profibus is described uh, with the difference. It doesn't have to use all layers. Profibus actually only uses three layers, layer one, two, and seven. Uh, layer one being the physical layer, we spoke about RS-485, so that would be your purple cable. Data link, that would be the Profibus protocol or FDL. How do I can communicate between devices on a Profibus network? And then your standard application layer, which is why am I using this Profibus network to transfer analog data or start or stop a BSD, whatever it might be. Uh, for Ethernet, this gets a little bit more complex and this becomes a lot more useful to describe uh, the different layers of an Ethernet system and how Ethernet systems uh, actually actually uh, work in this environment. So the first layer or the lowest level layer um, is the physical layer. Or one and two are both defined by the IEEE standard uh, 802.3, which is a standard Ethernet standard um, and adopted by millions of different types of technology. On your physical layer, this would be uh, the physical Ethernet cable, that cable used to in your office with the RJ45 connector that plugs into the side of your laptop. Uh, it also includes things like hubs and repeaters. A hub and a repeater can repeat an Ethernet signal, but it does not have any concept of routing whatsoever. So anything that, any Ethernet cable that goes into a hub or a repeater, uh, will just whatever comes into it will just repeat it out. So there's no concept of routing. Uh, these are these devices are, don't really exist anymore. Uh, it'd be probably very bad practice to implement hubs and repeaters um, in your industrial Ethernet environments. Um, on your data link layer, this would be the concept of uh, switches on the Ethernet side um, and MAC addresses, which is a physical addressing uh, each single Ethernet port on a component, whatever physical uh, MAC address. 
The data link layer is responsible for like reliable transmission of data frames between two nodes connected on a physical layer. So the data link would connect your laptop to the switch, which is sitting um, in the IT infrastructure. You have a network layer. Network layer is responsible for routing. So how can I connect PCA to PCB? Um, and this is where we would have the standard, I suppose you could IP uh, network it sits on top of an ethernet frame. Um, network or layer four, transport layer, uh, basically defines reliable transmission between data segments. So um, how can I reliably transfer information from PCA to PCB? Uh, you typically find onside an industrial ethernet network, you would have a standard ethernet frame. Inside that ethernet frame, you'd have an IP frame, which is responsible for the routing. Where must the message go to? On top of that, you'd have a TCP or a UDP frame. TCP or UP sits inside an IP frame and he's responsible for connecting the PCs um, and giving definition to the function of that message. For example, for all of you watching this webinar right now, the video uh, that you're receiving and my voice has been transferred most likely by UDP packets. Um, and the main difference, these are two competing technologies for different applications. Um, TCP is for more reliable connection, something where it's pretty important that a message gets or a Ethernet frame gets sent, gets received, and there's a confirmation of the receipt. Uh, there's a lot more overheads in TCP. Um, it takes a little bit longer to send data. Uh, so for example, if I wanted to send a mail, I would probably need to use TCP because I want to ensure that that mail actually gets received by the mailbox that I've sent it through. Whereas with like a video, live video, uh, like this webinar, UDP would probably be fine. UDP is kind of fire and forget. Um, although that later stage is confirmation that a UDP message has been sent, there's no point in me trying to backfill a UDP message if the time frame for the action of that UDP frame has already passed. And then in this top three layers, these are normally technology or vendor specific. Um, and then you would have your uh, session layer, such as APIs and sockets, presentation layer, which uh, has a lot lot to do with uh, encryption of data on the network, such as here's a couple of technologies you might recognize, MPEG and JPEG, which is encryption of uh, video and picture files. SMTP uh, and IMAP are actually used to transfer um, emails. Uh, and then on an application layers layer that you're probably used to actually visualizing um, in your everyday environment um, would be the end user layer, where you have things like HTTP that's responsible for uh, web pages, for example. SNMP, we're actually going to speak about a bit later. It's a diagnostic protocol used to manage network infrastructure and it's actually very useful to us in an industrial Ethernet environment. I'll speak about SNMP later on today. Um, some of the newer technologies such as AMQP and uh, MQTT um, for transferring uh, data, the new IoT, I suppose you could call them protocols. So the OSI model, data transmission, gets encapsulated all the way down to the physical layer, transferred out on the network, um, and as it gets received by the PCB or the, um, the target PC, that data will be received on the physical layer and slowly work its way up into an application layer where that Ethernet frame is useful. Now, Ethernet is used in lots of different environments, including corporate networks, what we call office Ethernet, um, and in industrial environments, we, we're going to speak a lot more about real-time Ethernet, and real-time becomes very important to us. Uh, this this table over here helps to describe uh, real-time Ethernet based on the different technologies and performance of the real-time Ethernet. But when you speak about real-time, what, what does real-time actually mean? There's a few um, there's a few definitions that we could apply to it. So the first for real-time is determinism. Determinism means I don't really care how long it takes for the message to come, but what's important is the consistency. Um, so when I was creating these slides, actually on my phone I have this app. It's called Thing. Um, it allows you to identify all the devices connected. It's on my iPhone. Um, connected and actually has a, a mechanism to ping. So ping is a, another um, protocol I call the ICMP protocol. Ping is mainly used to identify if a network is if a device is available on the network. So I'm sending a telegram to that device just to say, are you there? Or are you available? But it also becomes very useful for me to identify what is the delay in communicating with those devices. Um, so this app went and sent all of the ping messages out. Uh, I was pinging one of the Google servers, google.com. 
And you can see there's not a lot of determinism here at all. It's probably pinged like 20 or 30 times here, but this varied all the way from 4.9 milliseconds response time from the Google server to a maximum of 155 milliseconds. So this is a very unreliable uh, Ethernet connection, and this would not work in an industrial uh, communication environment, although it's my iPhone connected at, at home on my Wi-Fi network. Uh, there's quite a huge uh, deviation, which we'll talk a bit later, but it's called Jitter. Um, so this would not be a real-time network whatsoever. Uh, another thing which could affect things like real-time networks is things like overheads. Um, so some of the overheads we could speak about, uh, when you look at Ethernet IP and Modbus TCP, um, I suppose these would have slower cycle times uh, and less uh, protocol efficiency. Where Ethernet IP and Modbus TCP sit, is they sit on top, actually in that layer five, um, layer five, six, and seven, they sit on top of a TCP and UDP frame. So they've got quite a bit of overheads in order to transfer a protocol, which means that a Modbus TCP message or telegram needs to get packed inside a TCP frame. That TCP frame needs to get packed inside an IP frame. IP frame um, connects through a port and then it gets sent out on the Ethernet network. And those telegrams tend to become very slow um, and uh, very, what we call heavy. Uh, then you get a bit more efficient protocols, such as like CoffeeNet real time and PowerLink where these protocols actually bypass the TCP IP suite altogether. So they ultimately bypassing these two steps over here and they're going straight onto an Ethernet frame. So you'd have your standard Ethernet frame. We would take a Profinet frame, packed strings, the Ethernet frame sends on to the physical network. So now less overheads, increased protocol efficiency, increased cycle time. Um, the other thing that could also define uh, real time would be priority. So we'll talk about VLAN tags a little bit later, uh, but a VLAN tag also has um, three bits inside it, which can define how important is this message, it's some priority to it. Uh, things like a Profinet telegram have the highest level of priority, which would be level seven, um, which means that if a Profinet message um, and a standard non-real-time message, such as, I don't know, a video feed, Netflix, whatever's going on in your industrial Ethernet networks, gets received into a switch at the same time, the switch is going to take the message with the highest priority, which would be your Profinet Telegram. So now we're getting a more efficient uh, protocol. Um, and then you get protocols that run substantially faster where they actually go and bypass a whole Ethernet message, but then they ultimately pro um, um, utilizing the entire Ethernet network so for themselves, which means that you can't have other standard TCP and UDP messages traveling on that network infrastructure. That network infrastructure is only to be used for Profinet IoT or EtherCAT type protocols. Okay. Um, so in most industrial environments, uh, this layer is perfectly fine. If you don't require real-time control, um, maybe just reading temperatures or pressures working in this environment might be acceptable as well. It depends on what your application actually is. Um, but there again, how important is it to have it that real time? I mean, if I'm dealing with uh, advanced motor control, maybe I need a much faster protocol, uh, but in the standard uh, stop starts environment, it's probably okay. Now, three topics which uh, are important to understand in Ethernet based networks would be bandwidth, latency, and jitter. Um, Bandwidth, although bandwidth is very important in a corporate Ethernet, um, office Ethernet environment, uh, bandwidth isn't too important in industrial Ethernet type networks. So what bandwidth, the easiest way to think of bandwidth is have a look at a, a series of uh, pipes. So the higher your bandwidth, the wider the pipe, the more data that can flow through it. Right. Uh, this is very important in uh, office Ethernet environments so that we can share how much data can be shared from everybody's PCs and we can all share the network uh, inside it, but bandwidth does not guarantee real-time communication or high network performance that we expect in industrial Ethernet environments. The second um, definition would be latency. Latency is the time taken for a source to send a packet to the receiver. So how long does it actually take from the time I send a message to be received on the other side? And the reason I said that bandwidth doesn't really affect it is things that can affect latency could be um, for example, switches. Switches have a certain delay on the network. A switch needs to receive an Ethernet telegram. Uh, it needs to do some decisions on that Ethernet telegram, and it adds a bit of a delay in its, um, I suppose you could call it fly time. So if every single Ethernet switch on a network has a one or two millisecond delay time, 
it doesn't matter how fat the pipe is, your bottleneck is going to be your switch. So those are things that affect your latency. Um, and then Jitter, Jitter is a variance of latency. As we saw with our previous telegram, um, our standard deviation from our ping times, there's quite a huge amount of Jitter or changes. So my example over here, my first uh, telegram which I sent goes out of one millisecond. My second telegram goes out of five milliseconds, which means that I have a difference of four milliseconds. So my jitter is four milliseconds. And my third goes out at two milliseconds, which means my jitter is one millisecond. There is always going to be a little bit of jitter on any um, industrial Ethernet network, but it's managing that jitter um, to ensure that it uh, does not affect your communications in the network. And there's certain thresholds we'll discuss um, a little bit uh, later. IP addresses. So how many times on your PCs have you changed the IP address to what we call a static IP address, the screen over here, and then um, <coughs> typed in submit mask 255, 255, 255.0. What is, what is that 255? Um, we just type it in there because, well, it auto fills it for us, but we, we've been told that we need to do that. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about subnetting and what we're actually doing over here. Um, so Typing these 255s allows me to define the difference between my net ID and my host ID. Yeah. Got a, a small joke here. So the guy says, what is your address? So he says, no, here's my IP address. No man, your local address, 127.0.01. That's a reserved address for uh, testing development applications and that. So maybe you're hosting a um, Ethernet service on your laptop, for example, it'd be at a local address. And he says, no, I mean your physical address, and this would be your Mac address. What is the physical address of your Ethernet port, um, which is dealt with in layer two of the OSI model? So the difference between your net ID and host ID. All hosts within the network have the same net ID. So if I have a network and I have 30 devices on this network, each of those devices need to be able to communicate with each other, which means they all need to be on the same net ID. Their net ID needs to be the same for every single device in the network because that means that they're in the same, with the same range of each other. They have the same net ID and they can actually communicate with each other. As soon as the net ID varies from one device to another, they can't talk directly to each other without the use of something like a router. However, every single one of the 30 devices that have the same net ID needs to have a unique host ID. Just like in Profibus, which we spoke about last week, you cannot have two devices at the same address. And in Ethernet network, you cannot have two devices with the same host ID. Each of them needs to be unique. That's how we do routing and we can decide what is the address of where I need to send a, um, I need to send a uh, um, telegram to. Now, your net ID and host ID can vary in length. Traditionally, the, uh, it's, it's, it's varied by uh, 12168. So these four different parts. The host ID can be anything from one part to two parts, all the way to three parts. And obviously, inversely, your net ID could be one part, two parts, or three parts. Now, the larger your net ID, the fewer networks you can have. Oh, so, sorry, the, the larger your net ID, the more networks you can have, but the fewer host IDs you can have per network. So if you have a larger net ID, you can have a lot more networks in a uh, environment all connected to each other. But in each of those networks, you're going to have fewer devices on each single network. But with a larger host ID, I can have a lot more devices on a single network, but fewer net IDs. So it's a balance of what, what I actually need for that uh, application. Private IPv4 addresses. So this is standard IPv4. There's also a standard out IPv6. Um, We've actually run out of IP addresses, we ran out of IP addresses quite a few years ago. Um, IP addresses are used in the internet uh, to route to different web pages and services. Um, and what the Internet Consortium did is they assigned a few certain ranges of what they call reserved or private IP addresses, which cannot be assigned to public um, web pages and things like that. So, what are an example of where you would have a um, public IP addresses if I had to, for example, ping google.com. Google.com is actually just a placeholder. It's a placeholder for a public IP address. And here's my public IP address, 172.217.170.78. This is the public IP address that is hosted at the Google servers itself. And uh, there needs to be a new public IP address for all these devices. So now any devices which are addressed in my industrial Ethernet environment needs to be at this private IPv4 range. 
The other three different classes of IPv4 um, or private addresses, which you can use, it depends on what your application you want to use. Um, class A uses the dot 10 range, but you'll see here your subnet mask, the 255 defines that you would have, this would be your net ID, and then the following three parts would be your host ID. So I can have a huge number of devices over here, but quite a few number of networks. And I get class B, so I have fewer devices per network, but more networks. And then obviously in my reserve class C is probably the most common that you'll come across, 192.168. Um, I would have a large amount of IPv4 uh, net IDs, but only 65,000 number of addresses. This number pretty much just comes from uh, 256 to the power of 2 would give you 65,000. Um, and then 256 to the power of 3 and so on and so forth. Now, to connect all these different um, net IDs together, we would need something called a router. So as I said, if you have a device, two devices that are at a different net ID, they can't directly talk to each other. So in order to connect these two uh, devices or subnets together, we need to use a router that can make decisions on what messages go between all the different sections of the automation system. And the challenge which comes is why we can't connect these uh, networks directly to each other is things like um, network traffic. So there'd be a large amount of network traffic and if you start integrating multiple networks together, there's gonna be increased jitter, increased latency, uh, because the network infrastructure is going to become a lot more busy. But the other things is there's also broadcast messages which are sent through on each of these networks that can cause interference in communications as well. So it's important to use managed components such as a router to connect different net IDs uh, together. I was actually asked in one of my training courses, well, with these IPv4 addresses, how did they come up with this random number? It seems very odd, it's just not simple. So uh, a bit of research, the 10 range in class A was just come up with because it's easy, 10. Uh, and then the 172 and 192 ranges were um, assigned as private addresses because at the time, and I think it was 1991, uh, that they assigned private uh, IPv4 address ranges. These are the only ranges that were actually had a full complement available and that weren't already assigned uh, to public networks um, in the internet. So good Ethernet addressing practices on your site, whether you choose to use class A, class B or class C, um, would be to um, assign based, uh, based on type of device, type of area. It's completely up to you. Um, in this application, I'm using the 192.168.1. So here's my net ID, 192.168.1. Any device that has the same net ID can communicate on this network infrastructure. Uh, so this is my 192.168.1 range, and my net ID is the first three parts as depict, uh, defined by the 255s here in my subnet. So in the first 20 addresses, I assign all my controllers. The second 20 addresses are my switches to distribute uh, my I.O. My um, I.O. stations for my digital inputs or distributed I.O. are assigned in the 50 up to 99 ranges. Then I have BSDs. But what's probably the most important is to have a couple of uh, a couple of reserved addresses. So on any Ethernet network, it's very good practice not to assign every single Ethernet address out to devices in the network. The reason you'd want to have a couple of reserved addresses and might I add documented reserved addresses is you want the capability for connection of a laptop or a diagnostic tool, whatever it might be, uh, at a later stage and have that address available. But also have the capability to assign that address to um, your system integrators, uh, engineers that come on site uh, to work on your networks. Um, and this is this has actually been a, quite a bit of a challenge. Uh, a lot of times I'll do site audits and call outs on industrial Ethernet networks, whether it's Ethernet IP or Profinet. Um, and then when you get to the site, because of the poorly documented um, addresses available in the network, a lot of the times I can't assign a free address to my diagnostic tool to my laptop. Um, and that's a challenge because if I accidentally assign my laptop to an address that is already available in the network and I plug my laptop in, it's likely that I'm gonna cause a network failure or trip on that network. So important to keep that um, documented and um, available and have a procedure for assigning those addresses out. Now, within an Ethernet infrastructure, there's a couple of network components that are very useful to us. <coughs> The first of these would be a media converter. Again, like Profibus, 
the peripheral doesn't really care how the data bits get from one point to another, as long as they get there intact. So a media converter is a device that can convert your, I suppose you could call it copper or standard uh, copper ethernet infrastructure to things such as, uh, here I have an example of two fiber media converters, um, or a, there's a million different types of medias which uh, ethernet uh, infrastructure could run through anything from LoRa to fiber to Bluetooth to wireless, um, uh, wireless LAN or, or Wi-Fi, um, infrared and, and so on and so forth. Routers, now we spoke a bit about routers. Routers are our connection of two different types of networks. An example of a router which you probably each have in your houses would be your um, Wi-Fi, your fiber router uh, or your ADSL router, which you have. He's ultimately, again, routing. He's routing your private network, which is your IPv4 network in your house or your office, and connecting you to a, a public network, so a different IP range altogether. Uh, this is an example of an industrial uh, Ethernet router, obviously connecting a mobile network, which would be a public network, into your standard uh, LAN networks, per se. Uh, gateways. So again, you can't just, uh, sometimes you can't connect two different types of protocols together and expect them to talk to each other. If you have a Profinet device and an Ethernet IP device, they speak two different languages, which means that they cannot understand each other. So sometimes you need a gateway to actually convert between those two different, um, those two different networks uh, and where the network would, uh, the device, which you use as a gateway, such as an Anybus X gateway, would understand protocol A, understand protocol B, and be able to create the translation between the protocols, which allows you to share information. Um, <clears throat> gateways become very useful. I actually got a question the other, uh, actually yesterday, off the Profibus um, discussion, which we had last week, and uh, the engineer asked, we said, well, how do I connect Profinet to Profibus? Um, and I understand where his question was related. So Profi, ProfiNet runs a lot faster, probably about 100 megabits per second, whereas ProfiBus runs uh, quite a bit slow, anything from down to uh, 9, 600 kilobits per second up to what, 12 megabits per second. So he said, uh, are they directly relatable? Do I need a device that can just uh, slow down or buffer the ProfiBus messages? And not really, it's two different, completely different languages or protocols. So um, ProfiBus is not the same as ProfiNet at all. It's not the same language uh, whatsoever. So you do get gateways that can convert serial-based protocols such as ProfiBus and connect to uh, high-level Ethernet-based protocols. Access points Wi-Fi. Uh, one of the huge advantages in industrial Ethernet environments is that Wi-Fi is so largely studied um, and researched. There's such a huge amount of um, components available to plants to invest in that now have the advantage of low cost because obviously massive uh, or large demand, large supply um, uh, will bring down the cost and uh, the technology is readily available for everybody. Um, and also a large study to very reliable metrics. So you get some fantastic um, devices out there that can give you wireless connections uh, on your plants where possible. Uh, I would still always recommend having hardwired systems on your industrial Ethernet network if possible, but if you have an application such as a conveyor belt, uh, sorry, a, an overhead crane or something along those lines, uh, Wi-Fi technologies are very useful for connecting those remote type systems. And there's some very powerful um, Wi-Fi systems available as well. And then my favorite topic to discuss today is going to be switches. Um, I'm going to convince everybody on this webinar that you need to invest in managed switches by the end of the session today. Um, but yeah, sw switches, very, very important components um, in industrial Ethernet network. A switch is responsible for receiving data um, and connecting multiple different devices together through high speed connection. It's also responsible for buffering messages. Now, we spoke last week about the different technologies in industrial communication system, such as half duplex and full duplex. So we said half duplex means I can talk or I can listen, I can't do both at the same time. Full duplex means that I can talk and listen at the exact same time. Ethernet uh, tends to be, well, is full duplex uh, if you're running at 100 megabits per second or faster. Um, and you need a component that can handle uh, all that talking at the exact same time um, and allow uh, connection and buffering of these messages uh, between the different nodes. Um, there, switch is also a key component uh, in any network infrastructure. 
uh, for reducing unnecessary traffic, security protocols, creating redundancy. Um, but the main function of a switch in the most simplest form is to receive a telegram from one device, make a decision on where that telegram should go, and then send that telegram out only on the port that it is meant to go. That's what makes it very different to standard field bus technologies. There is routing and a switch will only give data to a device that the data is meant for. Now you get two different types of main switch technologies. You get uh, what we'd call managed switches and unmanaged switches. Um, an unmanaged switch, very simple device. Uh, it's plug and play. It doesn't require any configuration whatsoever. You uh, supply it with 24 volts. You plug in all your network components and the manager switches only function is going to be receive data from one port, make a decision where that's going to go and send that out. Um, a managed switch is a little bit different. Manager switches can do things such as prioritize traffic. Uh, they can support SNMP based protocols, which is a diagnostic protocol. Um, they have integrated statistics and diagnostics, uh, integrated security such as firewalls, um, even integrated routing technologies um, such as a uh, VLAN and ability to connect different networks. Um, but I've, I've got a good slide over here which helps to show the different ways in which unmanaged and managed switches um, operate. So the first one here, security. So unmanaged switches would have no security at all. You would have to manage the security yourself. Uh, meaning that the, an unmanaged switch doesn't have any integrated um, uh, ability to um, assign ports to unique IP addresses or MAC addresses. Uh, it wouldn't have integrated firewalls to prevent um, unauthorized or unwanted access into that network um, or even prevent certain different types of Ethernet data going on the network. Now on Ethernet networks, as I mentioned, there's thousands of different protocols which can run through there. You could configure a managed switch to only support a certain number of protocols. This could be very useful in your industrial Ethernet environment. If you only want your switches to be able to talk Profinet and not send through Netflix uh, UDP packets, you can configure that. You can prevent it from doing services that are unrequired. So managed switches have a much higher level of security and are, are pretty important components, uh, especially when interfacing um, with devices such as uh, third party IoT uh, plug and play solutions or integrating um, into your corporate networks, unless you're using something like a router. Functionality for sure, managed switches have a huge um, or much larger amount of functionality. Anything from integrated cable testers where they can test all eight cores of your Ethernet cables and check that they're intact um, to measuring current on the shield of, of uh, of your industrial Ethernet um, things, pick up if there's any EMI on the network. Um, a huge amount of integrated diagnostics and statistics. Um, diagnostics and statistics are very important for us in industrial Ethernet networks. With Profibus, a lot of our diagnostics can be visualized through um, having a look at the actual signal or scope image, looking at the ones and zeros traveling on the network. Uh, Ethernet, we don't really do that. We would be more interested in quite a few key diagnostics and I'll discuss this in some detail a little bit later. Um, but the diagnostics that can be harvested by a managed switch can very often pinpoint any communication faults um, or errors that might have occurred on a network. Anything from faulty device interfaces um, to noise and interference in your network <clears throat> to even a badly wired um, industrial ethernet cables can be picked up by those statistics. Redundancy, for sure. You can integrate, uh, there's quite a few different redundant protocols available for Ethernet infrastructures, uh, from AMRP to MSTP, and many other acronyms that a lot of the larger vendors will um, use in their switch uh, data sheets. But there is a, a lot of uh, technologies available to create redundant connections between different switches so that you can either aggregate a large amounts of data between the two different switches, or if one Ethernet link fails, you have a backup link that can connect to those networks. Complexity, so uh, put a bonus here to the unmanaged switch. The reason unmanaged switch is non-complex, it's a simple plug and play. Plug all your ethernet uh, devices into the unmanaged switch and it will simply work. Uh, you don't need to do any configuration or setup. Managed, switch, uh, managed switches tend to become a lot more complex and it's very important to understand how to properly configure and set up these managed switches because 
for example, trying to implement redundant uh, protocols and uh, technologies on the network without implementing it correctly or understanding how the technology works uh, can very quickly cause network failures apart from actually doing what you're trying to um, uh, trying to achieve by making your network more reliable. Um, so uh, what I would suggest uh, where you purchase your managed switches from, uh, see if the vendor or supplier can give you training on the switches. Um, and uh, yeah, definitely understand how to properly configure these switches uh, prior to implementing them on your network. And then probably one of the biggest deciding factors which I've seen in industrial ethernet environments for sites choosing to utilize unmanaged versus managed switches, um, even though managed has a huge amount of um, up points on unmanaged switches, is the cost. Um, <clears throat> unmanaged switches are, I'm gonna thumb suck substantially uh, lower cost than managed switch counterparts on a network. So um, it's probably good practice to always invest in a managed switch, but if you have a small three device uh, rear panel, then integrating a managed switch might be a little bit of overkill. You could probably get away with a low cost unmanaged switch, but on your integrated networks where you have um, plant wide industrial ethernet infrastructure, 100% I would recommend always implementing managed switches where possible. Um, there's two main technologies in um, switches that you will find. Uh, you get cut through and store and forward. Uh, cut through switches are very common. Uh, we mainly use cut through switches in, for example, Profinet IRT networks, um, as a cut through switch is a lot faster than a store and forward switch. All a cut through switch will do is you'll receive a Ethernet telegram. You'll read only the first few bytes of that telegram to determine where is that telegram supposed to go. So he's ultimately just reading in the first MAC address, which is in probably the first um, 10 to 20 bytes of the Ethernet telegram. As soon as he knows destination, he immediately passes through the entire telegram and does not care about any other parts of it at all. So we need to use cut through switches in like Profinet IRT networks, because in Profinet IRT, we want to reduce networks, um, we want to reduce uh, network delays and latency <clears throat> just as much as possible so that we can get much faster performance. Uh, for example, in multi-axis um, motor control and things like that. The store and forward technology is a little bit different. He'll receive the entire telegram, Ethernet telegram. He'll check, uh, he'll check the telegram to make sure that the telegram does not have any errors. Um, he will also decide where the telegram is supposed to go. If the telegram does not have any errors, then he will pass it out on the correct port on where he is supposed to go. Uh, store and forward are a little bit more reliable switches as they're not going to pass through a message if that message is damaged. Uh, one of the main checks he's doing on the telegram, apart from the length of it, is going to be he's going to be checking something called a CRC. Um, a CRC is a check in an Ethernet message to see whether a message has been received in the same formation that it was sent out. So you can check if anything's been damaged or changed. How things might be damaged or changed would be faulty device interfaces, uh, interference by your high voltage cabling. Um, that I said you should prevent a little bit earlier. Uh, and these could change the profi uh, or the ethernet message in some way. The store and forward technology would check that the CRC does not align properly with what the message should say, and he'll delete that message. And if you're using a managed switch, he'll in increment a statistic so that uh, the engineer can log into the switch and have a look at the statistics and identify, ah, oh, I've got CRC errors on one of my ports. Let me have a look at what's going on over there. So. Immediately now you've got a diagnostic tool that can identify certain faults for you. Uh, this is a bit of a useful table. Uh, mainly just shows uh, line, uh, the capability of um, store and forward or and cut through switches. Uh, so when you talk about line depth, line depth <coughs> is created by linking Ethernet components in line topology. And I'm going to talk about topology in, in a short while, uh, but a lot of times you'll find industrial Ethernet devices will have sometimes at least two Ethernet ports on them. And the reason you have two Ethernet ports is because then you can daisy chain the devices together. So in store and forward switches, if I daisy chain these devices together and each of those devices are sending data every one millisecond. So every one millisecond, they publish the data. That means I can only connect a maximum of seven devices 
in this line daisy chaining topology. Well, 14 are two listings, so you can see as my update time slow down, I can connect more devices. So store and forward, obviously adding quite a few line delays um, on the network, and that's how it hampers your maximum line topology. Whereas if I'm using cut through technology, um, such as implemented with Profinet, um, it's important to understand the technology of your switch when investing in them. You can obviously see substantially more uh, number of devices can be connected in this line topology. And um, if uh, if you jump on one of our Profinet engineers courses, we go in quite a bit of detail on IoT. Uh, but this is ultimately the way you're supposed to be connecting um, IoT and even Ethercat network infrastructures is by daisy chaining them into each other because they manage to minimize overheads uh, by sharing um, Ethernet infrastructure across there. Routers. The main responsibility of a router um, is the connecting of two different networks to each other. So in this example, I have uh, subnetwork A and subnetwork B. Um, you can see that my net ID in this case would be 192.168.0. So all the devices on this network need to have the same net ID. And on this network, my net ID is 192.168.1. All devices on this network need to have 192.168.1 net ID. So these are two completely different networks to each other because of that zero and that one, which is indicating my net ID is separate. So I have three separate components on my subnetwork A, and I have three separate network components on my subnetwork B. I need a device to share information or link these two subnetworks to each other. Um, and a standard unmanaged switch will not do. Main reason is because there's certain uh, network traffic um, and broadcast addresses that are going on here. And the same thing over here. So I need some device that can filter out those broadcast addresses and only allow data to pass through between the two different networks that has been enabled. Uh, that device is called a router. Uh, and routers connect two different subnetworks to each other. Main applications of where you would install a router would traditionally be connecting your um, your office network or corporate network, uh, factory network, uh, sorry, not your factory, to your factory network um, directly. Routers need to be configured um, and they usually do have quite a bit more latency than uh, standard switches. Virtual LAN or VLAN. Um, so VLANs are traditionally used with uh, devices that use the same network infrastructure. So if I want to create lots of different, um, I suppose you could call them subnetworks of devices, but share the same common infrastructure without separating the networks in such a, I suppose you could say, isolated manner uh, as, as the routing application, I uh, can enable the use of a technology of something called um, virtual LAN or VLAN uh, networks. This creates a logical separation of the networks and devices will behave as if they are physically separated from each other. Um, and the data will only remain within the local VLAN. So in this case, you can see that switches are being shared by three different networks. And over here, I have sort of network one, network two, and network three, purely assigned based on different VLAN IDs. The benefits of VLAN allows flexibility of using interconnected devices, uh, reduces unnecessary network traffic and delays, um, latency and jitter, um, provides system scalability and security, huge amounts of security, because unless you're on that VLAN, you can't communicate on that uh, network. Simplified network management, provided that the VLAN technology is understood and implemented correctly from the start. VLAN does require managed infrastructure components, so you cannot uh, implement VLAN using unmanaged switches. You need to use uh, managed switches that can support uh, VLAN functionality. All devices involved in the network need to support uh, the VLAN functionality. Um, and we have something called tagging messages, which is done at the switch port. So um, in this example, I understand that this is your Ethernet frame. So if you had to think of our OSI model, that's a layer two, where you have your data link layer, this would be the Ethernet frame that is generated in that layer two. Uh, and here I can see it's like my, my CRC would be sitting at the end over here. Um, and then there's here's my destination MAC address. So this is how I can decide where, which port that switch is supposed to go to. There's a few supporting um, data bits over here, but what the managed infrastructure would do is add this VLAN tag. And the VLAN tag would have a unique ID that corresponds to all devices in that specific VLAN ID. So in this case, our VLAN one, I have a controller and some IO devices in that VLAN one. All of these devices would need to have the same VLAN ID and the managed network infrastructure that understands 
the, the VLAN technology, we'll be able to route messages accordingly. Um, what's also pretty, uh, I spoke about in the first two slides uh, of my lecture, was priority as part of real-time performance. So there's a three-bit priority indicator in the VLAN tag, which indicates how important um, a telegram is supposed to be. Uh, Profinet, for example, takes a priority of seven, which in this case would be all three bits would be 111, which is in binary format seven, which means that that message will get the highest priority across the entire network. Also included in the uh, VLAN technology would be something called VLAN trunking, uh, where multiple VLANs can share a common network connection between different managed infrastructures. So those would be called a VLAN uh, chunk between the different sections of your plant. Cool, so let's uh, jump into installation considerations. How do I connect to Ethernet devices? There's a couple of different available connectors uh, which we use. The most common one that you've probably seen before would be this RJ45 connector. It has eight pins on the front. Uh, it should have a metal housing on the outside. This is where the shield gets clamped on the outside of that connector um, and gets grounded by the Ethernet component you're connecting it into. Um, for IP65 environments where you need a bit more protection <clears throat> from uh, external factors, you could use an M12 connector. And then you get IP65 RJ45 hybrid connectors that can also power devices um, and even converters to convert between the different types of uh, connectors in the network infrastructure. Last week we spoke about the different um, network speeds which you can run in proper so you can choose that network speed anything from 9.6 kilobits per second up to 12 megabytes per second and depending on how fast you run the network is how long the cable can be in a specific segment so for example our favorite border at 1.5 megabits per second my total segment length can be a maximum of 200 meters if i go any faster it's a maximum of 100 meters now ethernet um has a couple of different configurable protocols, uh, sorry, configurable board rates <coughs> or board rates that can be run at. Traditionally, it's not set. It's just uh, uh, enabled by a switch or, or device. Uh, and those would be uh, maybe 10 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second, and one gigabit per second. You can get faster up to like 10 gigabits per second now, which is uh, insane speeds. Um, so if any of you can guess what is the maximum length of a segment, 100 meters for all of those. Makes life a lot simpler. You don't need a table to remember what is the maximum length between two devices. It'll always be a maximum of 100 meters between any two Ethernet um, devices. What's important to note is Ethernet is not a, a bus type system like Profibus, which means that I'm not linking multiple devices with continuity on the copper cores. Um, Ethernet works with a point-to-point -point infrastructure. So every time that you plug an Ethernet cable in device A and device B, that's a segment. All right. Even if you create a line topology by linking um, three or four devices together, you're creating three or four segments. Uh, so an example of this is if I have device A, device B, and device C, I can connect device A to device B, device B to device C. All right. And then I could have a switch here, and that can connect to the switch. This would not be, would not have continuity at all. This would be three separate segments. You'd have segment one, segment two, and segment three. And that's because each of these devices would ultimately act like a small switch, uh, where this device connecting to this device, this device acts as a switch, and he would pass the telegram through and decide if he needs a telegram or not. This device would pass the telegram through. So completely separate segments altogether, which means that each of those segments or between any two devices, the maximum amount of cable I can have is 100 meters. If you need to go a little bit longer, um, you have two options. So firstly, you can connect a whole lot of switches in between your devices. Not a very elegant solution, uh, but the better option might be utilizing either um, wireless technologies. You do get, I mean, so like the Anybus um, wireless bridge and bolt ranges, I think can run like 500 meters on Bluetooth and wireless LAN connections, pretty, pretty insane technology. Um, or you could use something like fiber optics. So as an example of uh, integrating fiber optics on uh, this section over here, I have um, my substation for my PLC. So I've got my two PLC controllers over there linking into a switch. And then I've got my A sub and my B sub. These are two remote substations. 
And uh, within my individual subs, I have a maximum of 100 meters. So I can have 100 meters of copper cable connecting my switch to my devices. But the distance from my PLC sub to each of these substations is about 30 kilometers. So it's a pretty long distance, massive site this. So pretty much the one of the only options I already have is to run fiber optics. So a lot of the times fiber optics are supported directly by switches, or you could use um, media converters as I showed a little bit um, earlier, but I can directly link the switches through fiber optics and can run up to 30 kilometers in this uh, infrastructure. And what's fantastic about running fiber is this is completely immune to electrostatic and magnetic interference. It has full electrical isolation, um, but what is it also really nice as well is if I wanted to use managed switches, I could even create a redundant ring. So if I had to use either of these fiber cables to each of my substations, I would still have another path to communicate. I would need to use a managed infrastructure and the infrastructure would need to be configured so that it knows, oh, this is a redundant link. I must disable this link unless I lose one of my main fiber connections. The different types of topology that you would typically find in industrial Ethernet networks, uh, you do have flexibility on topology. Um, standard star topology is having a switch in the center and linking out to multiple nodes. Star topology typically used in isolated um, Ethernet networks where you would just have a, a controller with a couple of other devices and that's the end of the segment. Um, the second topology you'd have is line topology. Biggest advantages of line topology is uh, it's lower cost. Now, instead of having to have a single port on my switch for each single one of my Ethernet components, I can actually just link devices directly to each other. Uh, line topology is very useful to use, uh, and as I said, very cost effective, but you need to implement it properly and be careful of two things. The first thing is that each of these um, devices becomes a failure point for the entire network. If I have to lose this device over here, it means that I'm going to knock out this entire um, row of VSDs because he is responsible for connecting those VSDs to the rest of my network infrastructure. The second thing I need to take into account with lines prodigy is something called network loading or port loading. Um, I'm going to talk about port loading in a later slide. I've got a good slide to, to describe uh, what port loading is and how it actually affects me. Uh, third topology would be ring type topology, uh, where I have multiple connections between devices. There's lots of technologies that can be used to implement uh, ring type topology, very useful for redundancy. And then tree topology, typically used in what we call integrated networks, where you have multiple uh, smaller star networks all linked to each other. Uh, this would be the typical arch architecture we'd expect in a larger integrated network. Uh, Here's a managed Profinet Homes hold switch uh, where they're implementing two different types of technology. They have the start topology and they also implement something called an MRP ring, uh, which means that there's two points of connection between each of these devices. So good to do a study across all the different types of managed network components um, and implement the topology that is applicable um, for your application, depending on network um, availability that you require um, and what, what you want to do. As I mentioned, if you just have a small rear panel sitting on the field with three devices, a simple controller, a VSD, and some sensors, just using a standard start topology and linking devices together, or even line topology in that application, would probably be suffice. But for an integrated network, you probably want to look at implementing tree topologies, which can cost a little bit more. So for network loading, um, <clears throat> here I have a industrial communication system. I've got uh, three switches linking to each other. Here's my controller. I've got some IO devices in the field. And then in line topology, I've linked these two IO devices together. And then I've got a, a CCTV camera. Now that's very interesting. I can actually link lots of different network components in the same Ethernet infrastructure. So even if this network is Profinet or Modbus TCP, they can share the same common backbone or Ethernet connections to share multiple different protocols from Profinet Modbus TCP to UDP telegrams from a video camera that's monitoring my process or my conveyor system to check that there's no um, breakages or blocks. Okay. And this is very useful, but huge caution needs to be made with it because of something called network loading. Right. Now, in this first case, each of these devices, depending on, for example, the amount of data that they transfer, how often they're transferring the data, um, 
adds a certain amount of loading to the network. Remember, the network can only get so busy um, because each of these switches have a certain level of buffering, a certain number of messages that they can store and buffer before they need to forward, a certain number of messages that they can handle. And the more loading and percentages um, or uh, loading you add to those switches, the more um, busier and um, uh, busier the switch actually becomes. Um, so in this application, I have a 20% a net load coming from my video camera. He's quite busy because he's got a massive UDP telegram of 1500 um, bytes of data, of video data coming from. He's in full HD at the moment. Uh, and each of my IO stations only apply a 5% loading to each of them. So I add these three loads together. That means that this port over here is getting a 30% load on it. Another 5% uh, port loading is added by my HMI, which means that this port to link all of these four network components has a 35% net loading on it. At this switch, I've added on an additional IO station with a 5% loading, added 35 and the 5 together. Now I have a 40% net loading on this port over here. And at this, at this switch, uh, the loading gets split between the um, monitor, which is monitoring my, my HD video feed over here, and the controller that is controlling each of my I.O. stations. Now, this is a bad situation. And reason being is because my port loading needs to actually be substantially lower than 40%. Um, it depends on what your application is. If you have a look through, for example, the Profinet uh, guidelines and specifications, they recommend that your network loading never goes above 50%, and that's very over, um, that's very ex under exaggerated. Uh, I would highly recommend that if you're going above 30%, you need to change your topology or you need to slow down how often your devices communicate. Because um, even at 30%, your network stability is going to be uh, quite a bit lower. Um, you're going to have larger amounts of uh, jitter um, and, and your latency can get affected as well. So this 40% is almost guaranteed to relate in uh, what we'd call dropped packets. A dropped packet is where a switch deletes um, a couple of telegrams just because he's too busy, he can't handle it. He only has a certain amount of memory in him before he's like, oh, okay, I'm actually getting a bit full. I'm going to start deleting a few telegrams. Probably not too much of an issue if you delete some of your HD video telegrams. Probably just see a little flicker on the screen even if you notice it, but a very, very big issue if he's deleting telegrams from a, a safety line inside of your conveyor belt that is meant to stop the plant. So. We need to take into consideration to try and reduce this network loading. A couple of ways we can reduce the network loading is by reducing the load of devices. We reduce the load of devices by reducing how often they transfer data. So I could, for example, make my IO stations, instead of publishing every one millisecond, they must only publish every 10 mill, um, 16 milliseconds, which means that my 5% are going to go down. I could reduce the amount of data coming from the device, maybe drop my video camera from HD down to a low resolution to reduce his 20% loading. Or I can change my overall topology. So here I've uh, re realigned my topology. Instead of plugging my video camera directly into my IO station, I link directly into the main switch or powerful switch. And now I think I've actually fixed all my issues because my total net loading on this side is 15%. That seems fine. 20%, yes, that's below my 30% which means there's a maximum of 20% load over here, there's a maximum of 20% load over here, and the switch is able to do the routing between those network components. So this is probably an ideal situation of redoing my topology. So very important to keep into mind uh, network loading. Uh, how you can identify what is your network loading? Uh, there's a couple of ways. Managed switches will tell you that as a statistic. It'll tell you what is the port loading on each and one of the ports. So if you log into a web interface of your switch, <coughs> you'll often indicate on each of these different ports, what is the percentage of loading on that port and that can help you make decisions. Uh, there is some uh, calculators uh, available to work out net loading uh, online. You can email me for those as well. Um, or you can even use uh, third party diagnostic solutions such as um, uh, the percentage ether tap uh, along with Mercury and other software. Um, and what he would do is he would link between the controller a link between the controller and the switch or even between a switch and a certain segment and he can give you statistics based on like what is the total network loading what is the publish interval of each of these devices um, is there any crc errors and so on and so forth so uh, depending on the application there's a couple of different ways which you can uh, make these decisions 
connections between switches. So, so there's a couple of different options which we have. Obviously, huge amounts of redundancy technologies available, uh, which I'm not going to cover into too much uh, detail today. But two of the main ones: uh, spanning tree protocol, redundant spanning tree protocol, ensure the redundant path between switches without creating um, message loops. Uh, so if I had to integrate RSTP into this uh, network over here, these five switches, um, I would assign what we call uh, a redundant manager to one of the switches. We would ultimately control the redundant communications across all the different switches, and each of these guys are um, agents which respond to that manager. So in this case, there's one link to each of the switches, and then the dotted line indicates a redundant link that gets disabled or port that gets disabled by the switch unless it is required because another link has been broken. A uh, second form of uh, redundancy and use pretty common would be something called link aggregation. Not only does this provide multiple redundant paths between two switches, it also allows you to have a high level of bandwidth as you can share um, connections between these switches. What I mean by that is if you on this line have 100 megabits per second and on this cable have 100 megabits per second, you have double the amount of bandwidth um, or triple in this case with the three. Lines. So, so security considerations. Now, I said one of the best features of Ethernet is that you can interconnect um, multiple different networks and multiple different protocols across uh, multiple different types of systems, anywhere from your high level MES, uh, internet services with uh, Steve over here, um, your corporate network, and obviously your industrial communication network at the bottom over here. And it's very important to take into consideration there's certain security considerations that need to be integrated into this network. And not to mention my um, IoT device over here, which uh, should also be considered as part of your um, security analysis on the network. Um, and the main concern is that Ethernet infrastructure can connect directly to internet based protocols, which means there might be uh, unwanted access or use of these networks uh, where possible. And although I uh, little Steve over here is a big challenge for us and a big concern. Sometimes the risk to your network or the security concern to your network is not an external person and might not even be somebody with malicious um, intentions. It could just be a um, plant uh, operator who uh, connects, for example, a uh, media server or something to your network and creates faults and failures in your network because he's trying to stream Netflix. Uh, through the internet infrastructure without understanding the consequence of doing as such. So some of the main topics um, which are pretty important to consider. First one is firewalls. Firewalls are implemented in um, not only your, your PCs uh, and, um, and network components, but through things like managed components such as switches and routers. Uh, firewalls allow you to block um, certain services and uh, protocols uh, that are unnecessary in different networks. So for example, especially when you're integrating your enterprise network to, um, to your factory network, you might only allow, for example, the daily uh, targets or something to be downloaded through a firewall or certain uh, data points to go through the firewall um, from your controller or from your engineering station directly into your corporate network. So the firewall that's implemented in the switch can actually block any other traffic transferring through here apart from what is my total um, tons which are transferred today. For example, you can use a gateway for this application as well. Uh, routers, so routers allow for safe connection between two different types of networks and they will not allow any data to go between them that is not required on the two different networks. Uh, whitelist and blacklist, very commonly implemented in types uh, in switch type technologies. Um, a whitelist is a list that will only allow a certain number of uh, a pre-configured uh, device or IP address to access that service. So for example, if I have an eight port switch, and I have six devices connected to it, I can create a whitelist in that switch in that switch to say only the IP addresses or MAC addresses of these six devices can communicate in a switch. So if um, if a separate computer or something plugs into that switch and he's not on the whitelist, he'll not be able to operate on that network unless he's logged in, been added to the whitelist. A blacklist, um, less common is if I'm blocking a certain IP address or service or the thing. Blacklists would typically be services or ports 
um, which can be blacklisted through a um, firewall. So it allows only certain services or ports. IoT type devices, so connecting in uh, third party IoT type um, solutions and applications into your corporate network. Understand fully what the IoT device does. Um, ensure that the uh, supplier, um, manufacturer uh, who is um, supporting that IoT device uh, can properly explain to you the application service and how that device operates on the network. You want to make sure that you're not creating a unnecessary um, uh, weak point in your network as well. The use of VPN services is uh, very important in the network. So having an encrypted VPN connection uh, between your industrial Ethernet network and, for example, your plant uh, engineers and operators who might be working remotely. Um, this will prevent any data transferring between your factory network um, and the PCs being um, changed in some way or whatsoever. Another consideration, <coughs> making sure that you have proper backups and um, of all your configuration and programs, programs from your PLC software uh, to the configurations of your switches, uh, this backup should be stored and available by all plants, uh, engineers and operators. Um, in case network components get damaged, need to be replaced in some way, uh, this would prevent minimized, um, minimized downtime um, on, the, on the network as well. So the last section of our, um, of our discussion, identifying and correcting common uh, network failures. So the first one is actually utilizing proper industrial Ethernet cable spec for the system that, um, that you want to install. Uh, for example, PropyNet requires cat 5 e cable, which is a four core uh, shielded, uh, twisted shielded cable, and very important is the shielding. But that shielding is completely useless unless the shielding is grounded at multiple points in the network. So the industrial Ethernet cable that you're utilizing should have industrial Ethernet connectors, this metal housing on the outside of the RJ45 and on the outside of the M12 uh, actually grounds the shielding of the cable to the device that you plug it into. That device in turn grounds the shielding directly to the DIN rail. So ensuring that there's continuity between your DIN rail and a functional grounding point is very important. Uh, the shielding uh, does not, is not designed to protect the cable from um, physical harm, but it's actually designed to protect it from, uh, it's create EMI dissipation and uh, get rid of any EMI that might be uh, prevalent on that network. This is not an industrial Ethernet cable. You can see below here there's a, a BSD, uh, and uh, this cable was used to link in. This is an office Ethernet cable. It is not shielded, which means it has no protection whatsoever from any um, electrostatic and magnetic interference. This cable should not be used anywhere near your industrial Ethernet networks. So assembling your uh, Ethernet cables, a lot of times you can buy pre-built um, assembled patch leads, uh, but if you need to um, create your own separate connection onto a network, a standing knife is not an appropriate Ethernet construction tool. Main reason being inefficient and very easy to create wiring shorts. As you can see, there's a small shielding uh, sitting at the bottom over here, and you can very often short out one of your cores accidentally uh, by scoring that, and the, the best of us will uh, create those errors. Uh, if, however, you did accidentally create a wiring fault, um, wiring faults can traditionally be identified by the statistics inside your switches or possibly even the use of a um, cable tester in any uh, Ethernet, industrial Ethernet installer's toolbox. You need to have a decent cable tester that can not only test the core continuity, but can also check things like miswiring. You can check shielding continuity as well. So in this, in this case, you can see that there's a miswire. Uh, pin four is connected to pin six, and then pin three is not connected at all. Um, and what you can identify, obviously, the switch was plugged into port three. Uh, so this is the statistics table that you typically see in a managed switch. Uh, this is actually from uh, Siemens Scalian's uh, managed switch. This is a, a real life example of a breakdown I attended. Um, and then you can see on port three here, there's a huge amount of CRC errors, and also something called uh, frag fragmented errors. <clears throat> so this indicates that there must be some issue. So first step I did, took out my uh, cable tester, plugged it into that cable, and I noticed that there was a wiring error. One of the connectors was accidentally miswired. Okay. Now, 
Often where we're lost on an industrial ethanol network is, well, where, where do I get the diagnostics um, and health analysis statistics for my network? How can I utilize this information to determine the faults of states and overall health? So first step, switches. Using managed switches, I'm a huge advocate for it. Um, if you don't have managed switches because it's already been installed um, or for whatsoever reason you've decided not to um, invest in managed switches, there is third party products that will allow you to um, get the same level of diagnostics um, even without the managed uh, switch infrastructure, which I'll talk about in the following slides. But the types of statistics which a managed switch would give you, so the first one, port loading, we spoke about net loading. It'll indicate to you what is the total net load on each single one of the ports. You want to make sure that that port loading is relatively low. As I mentioned, it has to be below 30%. If it's above 30%, you need to change something. Um, now, have you noticed when you plug an Ethernet cable, even into your laptop or, or if you're working in industrial environments, there's normally two little LEDs. So the first one would be an orange and a green one, and they sometimes vary. So when you plug it in, the first light that pops up is normally the orange light. The orange light is called your uplink light. Uh, so it's basically saying, I can, when I plug it in, I can detect that there's two devices connected on the segment. So now maybe the visual representation, these two devices are actively connected. Um, and then the second one would be a green light where you'd start seeing the flashing green. That normally indicates that there's active communication. So those two devices are trying to communicate with each other. It does not indicate that the communication is good or healthy, but it's good enough that if you plug it in, it's immediately telling you, uh, yes, I'm connected and I am communicating with the other device. If you don't see those lights, then you know there is some sort of issue. Either the other device is powered off, uh, the device is not communicating, or <clears throat> your cabling is incorrect. And uh, other statistics will be on the switch will be uplink. So this, in the switch uh, web page, it'll tell you, do I have a link on that individual port? And it'll even tell you what the link speed is. Link speed is the same as your board rate. Is it 10 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second, or one gigabit per second? Now, why it's very important for me to understand or know that um, link speed is at 10 megabits per second, it means that I'm running a half duplex system. And Sometimes that's acceptable. There are some Ethernet components that run at 10 megabits per second by nature. So example would be like printers and some HMIs um, and even some power meters and stuff would <clears throat> only designed to run at 10 megabits per second and switches are intelligent enough to connect 10 megabits per second to 100 megabits per second. It's called um, auto negotiation. But if you've connected to a component that you know should be running at 100 megabits per second, and the statistic in the switch tells you it's at 10, it means that you have a problem. Um, you probably have some sort of error on the on the cable that you need to identify and pick up. So make sure that all your link speeds um, are running at the speed that you expect them to. Uh, then you have a statistics table, uh, very much like the previous slide. Uh, you type of statistics that are useful to you would be things like uh, C CRC errors. CRC error tells me that the telegram has changed somehow. This could be due to faulty wiring, faulty device interface, um, electrostatic magnetic interference, and a host of other, other problems. Um, fragmented messages means that a message has been cut off in some way or has been um, cut into smaller parts. That could be an issue. And then jabbers is traditionally always a faulty um, device interface where it almost seems as if a device does not stop communicating. So it's, it's constantly sending out uh, huge amounts of, of messages on the network. Uh, these switches would have an integrated log telling you if a device was lost at any other point. So immediately you have your remote monitoring uh, solution over there. Uh, LEDs such as the uplink and link speed uh, communicating LEDs on the devices, but also it have like a bus fault uh, LED telling you that there's errors in the network. Um, <clears throat> and if you have bus fault lights on your network components, please don't make it the new norm. Rather, clear whatever's creating that bus fault light and make the bus fault light your alert for your plants, uh, technicians and engineers. Um, I find way too often we we have a bus fault light, but we just accept it. Oh yeah, the bus fault light's there because there's an unconfigured device, don't worry about it. But we should, it's a, it's an alarm for us. It's a, it's a, it's a me mechanism for us to identify that there's problems. These switches will often have integrated SNMP managers or they'll support SNMP function. I'll talk about SNMP in, in a minute, but it's a diagnostic protocol that can give me useful information on the network. It could have alarm contacts, it could sound the siren, uh, send a digital input to the SCADA system, um, or even flash a light if there's errors. 
um, and can integrate um, their data directly into a, a SCADA network. So it's still very useful. Second place you can get a lot of diagnostics data from the network would be your from your IO controllers or supervisors. So you have a few examples. Uh, so the ABB controllers, the Siemens controllers, Schneider, or even a software controller such as like um, Codasys. Uh, firstly, these controllers would have uh, two LEDs named called BF and SF. SF, there's something wrong with my myself, my configuration system fault. BF bus fault means that there's some error out of my industrial communication network that needs to be addressed. Um, if you go into its integrated supervisor diagnostics, uh, log into the device with uh, the relative software, or even, <clears throat> for example, the uh, Rockwell PLCs have an uh, integrated web page that gives you some very useful statistics in the Ethernet RP network uh, that can help you to identify errors uh, for the Ethernet RP configuration. Um, understand how to use those supervised di diagnostics, whether you get training from these manufacturers um, or you attend, for example, certified ProfiNet training with um, the IDX Academy. Uh, we go a bit into these uh, internal diagnostic um, logs and show you what different common errors are as well. And a lot of these uh, controllers will have an event log as well, which indicates the snapshot in time, what occurred, why did advice disconnect, it gives you some more um, um, clues and hints on where you can identify a fault on that network. Utilizing a tap connector is uh, uh, very useful. Um, now a tap connector is very useful when you're using um, for both unmanaged and managed switches. So you would have to use a tap connector if you have unmanaged switches because um, firstly the unmanaged switches will not give you any diagnostics, but I can't plug an external software or an external testing tool into the switch to fetch information from it unless I can create something called a mirror port. Um, and I'll talk about a mirror port in the next slide, but what a, what a tap connector does is he basically connects between uh, two network components. So he acts as a middle guy and he sniffs the data traveling between the two different components. Very commonly you'd install this between the um, main controller uh, PLC and then the rest of the network because that's where all the traffic or the, the data is going to between the controller and all the IO devices. And uh, what is useful about these guys is he, he can plug into third party software whether it's Wireshark to analyze the telegrams using uh, percentage mercury to, to get a whole lot of data and statistics from the network um, and help you diagnose those issues, <clears throat> or even connecting it to a permanent monitoring device like Atlas, whatever it might be. Um, this is often a safer option because traffic is only one way. He'll only sniff and listen to data. He cannot send telegrams out onto industrial communication network. But the challenge with connecting in a tap connector is I actually need to break continuity with the PLC in order to plug him in. All right. So in order to connect in between my controller and the rest of my network, I need to unplug the controller, connect the tap in, plug in. Might be fine in a breakdown scenario, but when you just want to do a uh, diagnostic health analysis, that can be a bit of a challenge. Uh, so the percentic ether tap works directly with Mercury, um, uh, Wireshark, uh, and a couple of other software solutions as well. Um, without using a tap connector, if I have a managed switch, the other way I can access uh, all that data for my third party software, such as um, and diagnostic tools, would be creating something called a mirror port. So, on a managed switch, now that, well, let's take a step back. A switch's core function is to receive a message from a device, decide where that message is supposed to go, and send it out on the destination port. Which means that if I take my laptop and I plug into a switch and I want to see the data between other devices, that switch will not give that to me because that data has got nothing to do with me. The switch is like, oh yeah, okay, here's Carl's laptop, that's fine. But any of the data going between the PLC and the devices in the network do not have my destination address on them. So he's not going to give me any other data. So I can actually force him to give me the data by creating something called a mirror port. What a mirror port does is it takes ingress and egress traffic from alternate ports and copies all that data to a single port on a switch. Uh, this can be useful um, if used carefully, but it can also be pretty dangerous. Um, in my scenario over here, you can see this guy's uh, obviously very efficient, or uh, some might call it quite overloaded, but a mirror port does the same thing. Now, if you're on the edge with your port loading, a mirror port is going to double that because uh, you overloading your switch, you're creating a lot of uh, traffic for your switch and a lot of work for your switch's processor, and a mirror port can uh, push that switch uh, over a 
have shipped up farms before creating a report. So using a tap connector helps to mitigate that risk of a mirror port. Uh, you also do get ethernet based tap connectors that can be uh, connected into the network and you can access it um, into your office infrastructure. I think Kunbus is a good one as well. Um, so now if you wanted a permanent tap connection point, this risk which we said is that we need to unplug the PLC in order to plug this tap connector in, I can actually install in a low cost components like this thing called an ether mirror. What an ether mirror does is the PLC will plug into this link A, uh, or into this link A, and the rest of the network will like plug into link B. It's part of 20 volts. He stays in the ether, permanently connected, low cost network component. And any time that I need to tap into that network to do diagnostics without stopping the controller, without stopping connection, I can simply just plug my uh, diagnostic tool directly into uh, my monitor ports over here, do my diagnostic analysis, unplug, network is unaffected. Very useful for networks where you cannot um, stop the network whatsoever. SNMP. Now, SNMP is, uh, uh, I refer to it as a diagnostic protocol, so I may agree with me or disagree with me, but it becomes very useful. It's a Ethernet, a language that runs on the Ethernet network, um, and layer seven application there that allows me to fetch data from any Ethernet device that might be useful to me for uh, managing the network components. This is not just used in industrial Ethernet environments, it's used in corporate environments. Uh, a lot of the IT guys will, will be pretty familiar with SNMP for managing servers and all that. <clears throat> but where SNMP becomes very useful for us is it allows us to understand and fetch device data from a central point uh, without too much hassle. Um, you would typically have something called an SNMP manager. Uh, SNMP manager can take a few different forms. I'm going to show you an example of um, Mercury and Atlas, which acts as an SNMP manager. And what, is he, what he does is he sends out GET um, and SET requests to different network components. So here would be typical like a switch, which would be the master agent, and each of your sub agencies would be your uh, industrial Ethernet devices on the network. So you could get information like um, what is the MAC address of the device, what is the firmware version of the device, what is the software version of the device, uh, what is the link speeds on a device. So now if you have devices connected in the line spot, you can immediately check, oh, is there a broken connection somewhere in the network? Um, SNMP is even used hand in hand with another protocol called LLDP. LLDP is used to create topology for industrial Ethernet networks. So now I can plug a device in an SNMP manager that understands LLDP and has some um, integrated software that can make smart decisions. I can fetch the the LDP information from the network, and that can draw a true topology of what the network actually looks like. And what's that's very useful for external engineers who need to diagnose, maintain our networks to understand what does this network look like, what connects where, um, and very quickly I can make decisions on how to fix certain problems. And uh, in SNMP, you'll see something called a trap. A trap is a way for a SNMP component or agent to alert a manager of a fault, such as an alarm or an error message. So SNMP stands for Simple Network Management Protocol. Um, and uh, yeah, very, very, very useful. We, we discuss this in a lot more uh, detail in our ProfitNet engineers courses. So some diagnostic tools which I can use um, in this remote monitoring solution on top of my Manage switches and uh, and the rest of the components I just discussed. So first, your cable tester, very useful. Um, your cable tester should be able to test four and eight core Ethernet cable. Um, Profinet uses four core uh, Ethernet cable because he's happy with 100 megabits per second. Uh, some other protocols require eight core, which would be uh, to up to a gigabit per second. Um, Ethernet, you should definitely be able to test shield continuity. You should be able to detect short circuits, miswiring. Um, split pairs between different components. And what's very useful is you can even tell you what cable lengths are. Remember we have that limit, 100 meters between any two devices. So that he should tell you, oh wait, you had 110 meters. This is a this is a problem over here. And um, he would often have a little terminating component that connects onto one end of the cable and you can run the diagnostics on that network as well. Some switches can perform uh, switch testing diagnostics. Uh, but uh, from my personal experience, <laughs> don't do this on a live running network. Uh, you will trip the plant very quickly. Uh, 
having a diagnostic manager. Uh, this device over here, we spoke about SNMP earlier. This device, in all summary, is an SNMP and LLDP manager. Um, and he's also got some integrated diagnostic software that allows him to make some very smart uh, decisions on the state of the network and feedback useful um, user specific information reporting and such. Uh, it's called Atlas, Presenting Atlas. Uh, you can create a customized dashboard so you can see this topology. It's a chapter light for is the network good, healthy, or absolutely critical, um, and obviously generating reports. Uh, this is the topology I was speaking about with an LLDP, where a switch can feed back LLDP to the Atlas units. And he says, oh, I've got this device connected to port 2, this device connected to my port 3. And this allows us to actually draw a um, very easy to understand diagram, which is interactive and can give us this SNMP information on devices um, from their response times to their MAC addresses, software version, and so on and so forth. Uh, Q factors, quality factor, how healthy is my network? based on various different dynamics and statistics. It can generate devices that's very useful for commissioning. Um, and um, obviously it is integrated. If you use it with an ether tap, you can tell you what is the net loading um, on the network. You can pick up any alarms which have been raised in the network and give you various statistics on the ether network. And that is absolutely critical for any plants utilizing unmanaged switches. Um, and if you're using managed switches, um, it's very useful just to use this device without an ether tap to fetch all that SNMP information from the network. Uh, there is a lot of engineering specific software. This one called Nantilities is designed specifically for Profinet. Um, does a real-time scan of live list of the entire network. Uh, you can pick up any missing devices, duplicate addresses. Uh, Profinet actually uses device names to communicate. Um, so you can pick up uh, if that's if that's been a, been a problem, alarm handling, and also gives you detailed reporting. Utilities is also used with a tap connector or a mirror port. And uh, what's very useful about software like this, and also with the Atlas and the Mercury, is you can do cycle time analysis. And we spoke about at the beginning of this lecture, what is very important to us is jitter um, and latency. So in a real-time network, I really care about this variance in cycle time. So over here, you can see there's a whole lot of devices connected. And all these devices that are red are suffering from jitter. So you can see his, uh, it's not, not very clear over here, but he's uh, supposed to be communicating eight milliseconds, but he has at some point taken close to 32 milliseconds, or in some cases close to 64 milliseconds to communicate. So quite a, quite a huge amount of jitter over here. And it's important to identify, is there jitter on my network and make a, um, a mitigating step based on that. And then something like Presenting Mercury has the exact same software as the Atlas, which I showed uh, two slides back. Uh, it's a diagnostic tablet that uh, is an SNMP manager and uh, can give you, you get topology Q factor, uh, net loading, alarm statistics, reporting, and even as an integrated commissioning wizard, which uh, tests your industrial Ethernet network based on the standards and protocols um, released by the um, technology, um, technology vendors themselves. Uh, and determines is the is the is the network running according to specification as well. So after this lecture, next steps uh, apart from emailing any questions you may have to uh, the academy mailbox, attending certified uh, training on the specific technology you've installed on your site. Uh, IDX offers certified profinets and uh, installers and engineers courses. Um, alternative technologies you might be interested in is Modbus uh, training. We actually have a Modbus course on. Uh, on Thursday, so please jump on that if you are interested. Uh, also, industrial ethernet or the profit bus. Ensure that you're trained on the devices, especially the switches, managed switches that you're using, um, <clears throat> as well as the controllers you have implemented. How can I get those PLC stats or logs? Um, and if you're interested, getting some experiential learning from an experienced uh, industrial ethernet engineer, uh, you can come to your plants and explain different components to you and help you make decisions based on network design um, availability and so on and so forth. Invest in and learn how to use the various testing tools in your network. Get network audits if you need it done. Uh, if your networks are rather susceptible to failures uh, and shops, a network audit will highlight any weak points in your network and how you can improve that. Um, and have a support resource on um, Vidal. Follow us. Uh, we have uh, often some very useful um, blogs available. We have blogger.idx.co.za. Uh, if you are interested, we often post some useful content there. Um, for more training sessions, 
and useful tech tips. We post stuff on our LinkedIn networks. All of these videos uh, from the session will be posted on our YouTube channel, just Industrial Data Exchange on YouTube. Um, so if you ever want to come back, review them, uh, share it with any of your colleagues, please do so. Um, and then obviously you can contact us in the Academy mailbox, academy at idx.co.za, uh, or visit our webpage for any more information on what uh, what what we do.